So uh, basically, I'm going to take all that and try to try to talk a little bit about what the future might hold specifically for vulnerabilities and what we can do to make code more secure. So one thing to keep in mind is attackers will continue to feed their kids. And the companies who implement the 80-20 rule, um, basically they're going to leave enough to feed the kids. So they won't be on that one infomercial. So one big issue that's going to happen in the near future is porting 32-bit code to 64-bit code. Um, it actually results in a whole lot of issues that uh, are sort of subtle. Um, does anybody know what the vulnerability is here? So basically, on a 64-bit machine, you can loop through all these and you can increment i. And on a 64-bit machine, you can have more records than 4 billion. Uh, basically, you can have up to, uh, I can't remember the, no the number off the top of my head, but it's 4 billion times 4 billion. Um, it's a big number. So then when you're actually returning the data, you return an integer inside this function. And uh, basically, you can le it leads to uh, being able to overwrite memory and all of the bad things that have allowed attackers to uh, compromise systems. So here's another one. Um, does anybody know what uh, 0xFFFF is? For, for what? Oh, OK. Yeah, in HTML, right? Yeah, totally. So in HTML, it is totally the value for white. Um, so with an x86 processor and all 32-bit processors, um, basically FF is the largest number you can possibly have on a 32-bit system. If there's eight Fs, that's the largest number. And when you turn that into a sign number, that's also equal to negative 1. It's a little bit confusing, but uh, it boils down to the fact that processors don't subtract. They only add. Um, so with this, a lot, of, uh, a lot of attackers will take this and say, uh, OK, um, I'm going to call this function right here and check to see if SO equals error. But a lot of programmers don't like to type very much. So instead of typing, for uh, those Fs, they might just substitute negative 1. On a 64-bit system, though, uh, those Fs are not equivalent to negative 1. You need eight more Fs in order to be negative 1. So because of that, when this code is ported to 64-bit, it can result in some very subtle vulnerabilities that you need to catch. OK, so this one right here uh, relates basically to, um, again, calculating the size of something on a 64-bit system. Now. Uh, so it's not very easy to see right here exactly what's going to return. You need to be able to keep three lines of code in your head. And if that was a long function, you'd need to keep a lot more in your head. Um, however, when you're looking at it from the binary perspective, uh, someone who's familiar with 64-bit x86 code will see that it's loading the RAX and RBX register into EAX. Now, RAX and RBX are 64-bit. So when it loads it into EAX, it can actually truncate the value and if it's calculating for if it's calculating the size of something to store in memory, it can uh, basically end up wrapping and cause a smaller al allocation and allow attackers to overwrite memory. So uh, I also think that in the future, as the vulnerability classes sort of get hunted into extinction, and everybody's uh, killing off the twenty percent that are currently being uh, fixed, there's going to be uh, exotic bug classes that will be exploited more often. Um, transitive trust is kind of an idea that we spoke about at uh, Black Hat. Basically, um, is everyone here familiar with kill bits? So basically, it's a bit you can set in the registry that says, this control is not allowed to be loaded ever because of the security implications of loading this control inside the browser. We actually found a way. Um, generally, the way this is done securely is there's one piece of code that's tasked with uh, deciding whether or not an ActiveX control can be loaded. But we actually found that that wasn't the case. We found that 
a plug-in or an ActiveX control was capable of loading ActiveX controls, and they actually weren't checking the security. So as long as you had a, a control that wasn't qubited, um, it, you could load any control you wanted, and uh, that results in generally bad things. Um, type confusion, object retention, all of those are t uh, vulnerabilities that, although there have been some released, they're not as popular as I think they're going to be in the future. So uh, basically, this is a little graphic here. Um, we're not going to um, stop developing code anytime soon. And because of that, there's new lines of code that are written. And each potential new line of code is a potential way for an attacker to go in. Uh, and as the attack surface increases, I like to use the colloquial term bling in order to describe vulnerabilities being present inside the code. Because doing my job every day, I have to look at bugs as a good thing. Because otherwise, I, I go insane. So uh, also, as there's more unique bug classes that are found and being exploited, it will allow more exploits and vulnerabilities to be found inside code. So if that's the vulnerabilities we're looking at, we're looking at sort of an exponential curve up of the types of uh, possibilities that attackers will be exploiting in the future. So uh, there's some stuff we can do to prepare, and uh, we're going to be busy bees. Uh, basically, binary audits of third-party code are going to be something that's important. Uh, who here develops applications? Who here uses libraries developed by third parties? and doesn't have access to the third-party source code. Yeah, so binary audits are going to be pretty important for those types of people, because without that, you have no uh, ability to determine whether or not your code is vulnerable, simply because other developers weren't very uh, cautious with what they chose to accept. So I also think, as an industry, uh, we need to continue to develop cutting-edge tools to sort of make binary audits and finding these new classes of vulnerabilities easier. Some of these uh, vulnerability classes actually run into the Turing problem, and it's going to be very difficult for us to develop code that automatically deals with them. But as long as we can develop code that helps people find them, I think we'll be good off. And uh, we need to adapt to the 80%, basically. So this is sort of the conclusion and the, the things I hope you guys remember. Threats will continue to adapt as long as kids are hungry. And kids are really hungry, generally. And uh, the 80-20 rule, when someone says that they've closed the 20% uh, most important vulnerabilities, that should not make anybody feel safe. In fact, uh, that should make you feel a little more scared. And also, the best way to find uh, bugs inside code that's been heavily audited and secured is by looking at it from a unique vantage point and not looking at it from the same perspective that everybody else has. And if you're reviewing the same piece of code, you shouldn't necessarily use the same methods that you've always used. You should try to sort of have a fresh take on the code. And uh, that's all I have. Do I have any questions from the audience? Anybody? Yeah. So with Java code, um, a lot of the stuff that you look at from a binary perspective is sort of magically handled by the Java compiler. And I wouldn't necessarily look at the Java code in order to determine whether or not the vulnerabilities are present. Um, it might be an interesting exercise to try out. I personally haven't. But uh, if you're actually looking at the, uh, the Java runtime engine, then if you look at it from the binary perspective, I'm sure you'll find some good stuff. But I can't say too much more about that. Yeah. About how often do you actually find a serious <coughs> critical level vulnerability that you know that you all the time? Uh, Give me a percentage. <laughs> <laughs> For you, a hundred and ten percent. Basically, I, I don't stop until I find something that's critical. Uh, Always have well, so far, uh, I can't jinx that. I suppose. Um, aren't there people out there auditing?